the end of an era for the Buffalo Bills, as well as our wrapping up of the positional review with the safeties and cornerbacks this week on the Wandering Buffalo podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome into this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. My name is Justin. I will be your host today. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about. Um, So this week's episode was just supposed to be our pretty straightforward um, review 2023 recap of uh, our position groups, looking at the safeties and cornerback rooms and you know, some of the stuff that happened this week will play into that conversation. Um, but just a crazy amount of moves with some serious implications that uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't start the show with. Um, so, I mean, by the time you're getting this episode, it's it's not breaking news anymore. Glad we're not a breaking news podcast. And honestly... Um, some of my reactions to these moves as they happen versus uh, as I have a little bit of time to to stew on them a little bit and, you know, kind of place everything in line. Um, kind of glad to be a weekly podcast at times like this uh, because my immediate reaction uh, would be far different than than where I'm sitting right now. Um so just right off the top, just going to run through all the transactions that happened this week. Um, I will say, I believe it was March 6th that it was kind of like right at 4, 430 range um, when it was announced Jordan Poyer was cut. And I had like just shown up to work, you know, just about to start the shift. And like it was a kick in the guts to to start with. And then. You know, as the night starts getting busier and all, all these other transactions start rolling in, I, it was just <laughs> just a terrible time with my phone blowing up, people trying to talk to me about it. And, you know, every little notification coming in, I'm wondering if it's somebody else, what's going on. And a lot of it was so um, bad day to bad day to be at work while all this is happening. But just kind of a recap on what's happened through the offseason so far. Um, the Bills re-signed David Edwards, um, brought back Matt Hawk, um, and then March 6th, which was just kind of doomsday for my feelings at the time. Um, we released Jordan Poyer, Trey White, Saran Neal, Mitch Morse, Deontay Hardy, and Naheem Hines. Um, follow that up with re-sign, bringing back Mitch Trubisky. Um, we brought Taylor Rapp back on a three-year deal and uh, most recently re-signed Q Morris. Um, so just kind of going through one by one, um, re-signing David Edwards, love that. Um, I think he was a a great kind of like six-man for the offensive line last year. I think he did a great job um, in the jumbo sets when we were using him as that extra blocker. Um, somebody I felt last year that we were like fortunate to be able to bring in as a depth player, um, considering his history with Aaron Cromer, um, feeling like he had starting potential. Um, and it looks like depending on how everything shakes out with the rest of these cuts, um, it looks like he might end up having, you know, that starting, starting role, depending on where pieces end up. Um, the signing of Matt Hawk, uh, I've seen reactions all over the place about this one. Um, it, it doesn't really do much for me in either direction right now. And um, for me, I, I kind of just wanted to get in that spot where we're not talking about hunting special teams every offseason. Uh, it looked like we had that for a little bit. Um, I'll say this, Matt Hawk was an inconsistent punter. Um, I'd prefer to live in the world where our offense is performing and we don't really have to worry about 
you know, some shanks here and there. Um, it was concerning and always seemed to happen at the worst times when he was here. Um, but, you know, not being able to take the game to overtime against Kansas City because we missed a field goal wide right and some of Bass's inconsistencies this year. Um, I, d I don't want to do this thing where we're having the conversation about holding all the time, but if if the chemistry between the field goal unit and the holding is going to be that important that we can get the best version of Tyler Bass with Matt Hawk here, I'm willing to give something up in the punting game. Um, you're going to win, win and lose more games with the field goal unit than the punt team. Um, is kind of where I land on that. I'm once again sitting in this chair here saying that I would love to have a not, not great punter, just give me a good punter that's also an above average holder. I, I would love to have both. Um, if I got to pick between the two, and that seems to be kind of where we're at right now, give me the better holder, I guess. Um, and then moving into the meat of everything that happened and... Like I said, this was just a kick in the guts as it was happening, and I hated every minute of it while it was happening. Um, but kind of being able to take a step back, process, you know, where we're at with everything, I feel a little bit better about some of these moves that were made, not all of them. Um, and Joe Marino, great podcaster, somebody that I listen to on a daily basis. Um, always kind of brings things back into context for me of like, we don't have to like these moves right now. Uh, we can sit here and say, well, what's the alternative? What's the answer? Um, we haven't even started free agency yet. We still have the draft to move through. We still have, you know, kind of the post draft free agency. Brandon Bean's job isn't done until we get to like late August, early September. It, kind of sits here right now feeling like we've created more holes. Um, I'm going to kind of sit back and see where things go. Um, but I'll start with Jordan Poyer. And this is when I say it's kind of an end of an era for the Bills. Um, just kind of watching the way this team came back to relevancy. And it was through some of these cornerstone guys that aren't going to be on the roster anymore. And it, it kind of took me back to Kyle Williams retiring and just kind of like the emotions of how great he was as a player, how awesome he was for the franchise, and like to to not go further with him was really hard for me. And it's kind of similar in this, except that like the team has had the sustained success. It was just kind of getting over the hump. Um as I take a few days to kind of collect my thoughts on this, um, these are the types of moves that good GMs have to make um, and that bad GMs are afraid to make. Um, if we're talking about Super Bowl windows and keeping them open, um, we kind of have had this core of players together and not gotten over the hump for the last three, four years. Um, and to kind of keep mo pushing money into the middle on, on the same core, something has changed eventually. And unfortunately, when you have a good team that's having success, you're, you're more apt to fall in love with these players. Um, and it's going to be harder when you have to choose to move on. Uh, I thought Poyer still had some juice last year. Um, but when we're looking at, keeping that Super Bowl window open and ways to free up money to kind of get cap compliant and be able to have some wiggle room. Um, these are the kind of moves that we're going to have to see. And ultimately I take a step back and I look at this of, okay, so we had to create the cap space, right? And when you're looking at, you know, the levers that can be pulled to get you there, um, some of the obvious ones staring at you in the face that were giant ways of of bringing that cap relief was restructuring Josh Allen. I still think that's going to happen. That's going to give us some money to play with. And then between 
um, Diggs and Von Miller's contracts, that was freeing up all the money that you had to do, but you're pushing more money into the future. Um, and, you know, seeing, seeing the reactions on Von Miller at the end of the year, did you want to, you know, push more of that money into the future, kind of lock him here longer slash pay him without being here? Um, and then Diggs, I think, is in a good spot. Um, I am talked about it when we did the receivers. I'm not doing any of the Diggs drama this year. I don't really buy into it, any of that. But for anybody that wants to get involved in that, you have him for another three, four, five years, depending on how you look at this contract. Um, do you want to kick more of that money down the road? So, you know, you're talking about, about whether or not he's on the roster, you know, still having a, a cap hit for a guy that might not be around. Um, and that's just kind of talking aging out of the system, not getting into does he want out of Buffalo and all, all that extra stuff with it. Um, so tough choices had to be made and it's different, different ways of freeing cap than just kind of pushing more money down the road. What I feel like Bean was doing here is the last like three seasons, he was like this team we have right now is going to get it done. We're going to give him a few years to do it. And this off season, he kind of looked at it as we've had that core. We haven't gotten it done. Everybody's just continuing to age. We got to kind of hit a reset button on the fly here. Um, it made some tough decisions. Um, Trey White being cut. Now, this is a, a post-June 1st designation, so you won't really see it on the Bills' official transaction wire yet. Um, all that really means is his cap space is not freed up right now. Um, so that'll be kind of after the draft. You're going to get another $10 million, and that can be for the draft class, some of these leftover free agents. I'll say that the Trey White one probably hurt me the most, and that's from a personal emotional standpoint. Standpoint, excuse me. Um, Trey White's been one of my favorite players on this team, if not my favorite. Um, kind of through our return to relevancy, right? Um, you know, the that first draft pick, his team starting to turn around. Um, he was great in the community. He was great on the field. Uh, he had a fun personality. Unfortunately, when you start having to look at the business side of football, um, we've essentially had to operate for two and a half, three years without a healthy Trey White anyways. Um, so we've kind of already, we've kind of already operated as if he wasn't here. Um, and in the meantime, you made the trade for Razul Douglas. Um, while we're on Razul Douglas, he got restructured, so he's going to be sticking around. Um, you drafted Christian Benford, and he looks like a stud. You still have Kyer Elam in the wings. You still have Taron Johnson. Um, so, I mean, effectively, you've all but officially not had Trey White on the roster for pretty much the last three three seasons, right? So when you're talking about a bigger contract like his and coming off of, you know, two serious injuries and kind of having to bet on whether or not he's going to be the same guy that he was, um, when you've kind of already made the move to replace him with Razul Douglas, I, I just think business side, this one completely checks out. It makes sense. Um, Saw it coming, if I'm being honest. Um, as a fan, don't don't feel better about it at all. Um, absolutely love Trey White. I hope he's able to bounce back from these injuries and and you know have a real strong finish to his career. Uh, on the business side of it, I it, this is like a risk reward financial decision, and honestly when you're talking about being able to free up $10 million um, from a secondary that's already been playing strong and we've already had to operate without him, I, I completely understand this one. Um, the next one I want to talk about is one that I, 
I don't fully understand. And I'd say this is the one that I probably liked the least out of all the moves we did. And that was the release of Mitch Morris. This one kind of came right on the heels of having traded Ryan Bates to the Chicago Bears. And, you know, I was kind of looking at that as there wasn't an opportunity for Bates to start here. Um, kind of felt like that was really telling us that Mitch Morris was going to be back. And, you know, it's always a question because he's popped up over the last few years as a bigger cap hit that could be a cap casualty. Well, we finally saw it. And this this was a move I didn't like in particular only because I think we finally saw a good one through five offensive line in front of Josh Allen last year and kind of just wanted to maintain status quo there. Um, run it back. I don't think our offensive line was to any degree, any of our issues getting over the hump last year. I think that was the best five offensive linemen we put together. Um, I understand it was a bigger cap hit, we freed up about $8 million there, kind of an aging player. Um, this one, I, I, I still don't like this one. And I guess we'll see what happens, what the plan is going forward here. Um, it looks like, you know, McGovern has some experience playing center. He might be sliding over and that David Edwards contract might make sense, you know, for him to slide in um, at the left guard spot. Um, it's just a spot where talking about continuity and all that, it, it's just a spot that was finally looking solidified. And now I'm back to, we'll see how it looks. Um, so yeah, that, that one was tough for me. Um, I guess on the surprising side, both Deontay Hardy and Naheem Hines end up being cut. Um, I talked about it a lot on this podcast of kind of feeling like one one or the other would be back, but not both, um, that you'd probably have to play with some contracts. A little surprising to see both of them get cut for me. Um, not really not really losing any sleep about either of these. Um, Naheem Hines being kind of an electric returner. We never really got to see him used in the passing game. Um, but again, somebody with a couple of years on the tires and coming back from an ACL injury, when you're talking about a tight budget here and you're spending, um, is that, is that where you want to roll the dice or do you want to kind of explore different options? And I'm fine with that. Um, I did think Deontay Hardy came alive a little bit towards the end of the year. Uh, but when I talked about the receivers, I talked a little bit about um, him seeming a little bit upset with his role here. Um, he had the turf toe injury in 2022. Maybe he was kind of still working through that. Um, maybe just kind of the wrong time to bring him in. Um, wish him the best with another team. Maybe he can carve out a bigger role. Um, but as far as like thinking about replacing his production... I'm not overly concerned about that. Um, I think he was a, a good returner. Um, I also have strong feelings about the return game in the NFL right now. And in particular for punt returns, where I think he kind of shined a little bit more. Um, you all know by now, my primary concern is making safe, smart decisions on the return and getting the ball back to Josh Allen in the offense. And I care about that much more than a return man that can, you know, average 10, 15 yards per return and, you know, possibly break one for a touchdown once in a while. I think with the offense that you should have, just get the quarterback, the ball back. Um, and then the final cut thus far was Saran Neal. Um, again, Elite special teamer, um, but when when we're up against the cap like this, you got to find creative ways to save some money. Um, yeah, there, there's a finite amount of you know special team specialists. I talked about this a little bit with the linebackers, um, and 
kind of turning over some of those spots on the roster and getting your younger, cheaper talent to contribute in those areas. Um, so I think Saran Neal was a great special teamer for us for a while. Would have loved to see him occasionally, you know, be a guy that came off the bench and made an impact, especially when we look at last season, we're, you know, dealing with cornerback injuries all over the place and just never somebody you really wanted to see come in and play defense. Never really had much of an impact there. Um, so I'm good with resetting that spot. Um, get younger and cheaper on the outside or on, on the special teams there. Um, bringing back Mitch Trubisky as Josh Allen's backup. This one is, it's very meh to me. Um, I don't think Mitch Trubisky is um, immediately becomes like one of the better backups in the league. Um, when he was here last, we heard the defense talking about, you know, the looks that he gave him with the scout team, all that he has familiarity with Josh Allen. And I mean, ultimately without spending a ton of money on the position, that you hope never actually touches the field except for some, you know, garbage time kneel downs or whatever. Um, I see a lot of people that really hated this move of bringing Trubisky back, but like, what's your alternative? Um, you're not spending a ton of money there. And I, honestly, when you're going from a talent of Josh Allen's caliber at quarterback, like who are you going to bring in that that's going to, let you even sniff the same amount of success. Um, I will say that I've talked about this in the past as well. I do want to see the bills use one of, you know, a later round pick on just like a, a toolsy wild card quarterback in the draft. Um, I'm not expecting them to, you know, come in and be Josh Allen if he gets hurt, but have somebody that you can have in the building for whatever, four or five years, you know, on that rookie deal, you're not changing the position every year. Um, it's low cost and give me some, somebody with some physical tools. Give me like a cannon arm in athleticism that, you know, never really put together reading the field and whatnot. And, and let me have some variance, you know, if Josh Allen ever goes down, let me, you know, throw a curveball at the defense that they have to plan for something else now. Um, so it, it, to me really doesn't matter who the backup quarterback is. Um, not to say it doesn't matter. It obviously has an impact. Um, it, there's not a ton that could have happened in this position that would have moved the needle all that much more than Mitch Trubisky. Um, then re-signing Taylor Rapp. Honestly, the initial details of the contract looked a little inflated to me. Um the cap hit for this year was something like two, $3 million. Um, it's, it's honestly kind of a drop in the bucket for a potential starting safety. Um, I don't think it even precludes you from still going out and getting two more safeties that could be starting level. Um, I think he kind of had a rough start to the season last year and started to come along as the season went on. Um, and you're still talking about all kinds of injuries bringing him into action and just kind of a convoluted season to read on defense, especially in that secondary. Um, the biggest thing with rap for me was kind of almost reckless at times. You know, we saw some friendly fire of him kind of hitting his own dudes, whatever. Um, I forget what podcast I was listening to, and I believe it might have been Locked on Bills with Joe Marino again. Um, and he made the point of you're kind of resetting the safety position and don't have the urgency to make a decision. And a guy that was in your building for a year with Sean McDermott is a guy that he decided to bring back. Um, and honestly, with wherever we go with the safety position right now, there's a ton of free agents out there. Um, there, we kind of saw this with with Poyer. Um, the market's not really there. You can get good starting quality safeties. It's a position 
kind of being devalued in the NFL. Um, as all these teams are playing like too high and want to want you to, you know, nickel and dime them underneath. Um, that kind of combined with what we've seen McDermott do with the secondary, what we saw, what we've seen Bobby Babbage do, you know, he was a safeties coach and now the defensive coordinator. Um, it's easy to kind of forget that Poyer and Hyde for as great as they were with the bills before coming here, they were kind of like cast offs, you know? Um, and I, I have to attribute, you know, a lot of that to the players themselves. Yes. Um, but to be able to coach those guys up and I just, I have faith in this organization, you know, with whatever safeties are brought in to coach them up in and be able to get ser- well above serviceable play out of them. Uh, and then the last transaction before we take a break here was bringing back Quentin Morris. Um, Love this move as much as I can love a third tight end being brought back. Um, His cap hit is not even a million dollars. And honestly, when he's had to come into the game and play some receiving reps, I feel like he's been a decent option in the passing game. Um, Whether it's what he's doing or kind of being an afterthought of the defense. Um, He gets after it blocking. He plays special teams. Um, and costs us next to nothing. So again, as much as I can get excited for a third tight end being brought back, very excited about Quentin Moore staying in the building. I'm going to take a quick break. And after the break, we're going to talk about our review of the cornerbacks and safeties. It'll be an abbreviated version based on some of those moves that I just talked about, but stick around. Hey, this is brother Bill. Now back to the show. Welcome back in and thank you again for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. Um, If you have made it this far, as always, I do ask that you like, share, subscribe, Uh, make sure you're not missing any episodes. Um, As we go through this off season, there's going to be just a ton of things going on. Free agency hasn't started yet. The draft is right around the corner. Um, As some of these other moves happen, Uh, We're going to have some episodes where we're reacting a little bit more quickly, um, time provided. um, And just with the off season gets a little crazy. uh, So just make sure you're subscribed. You're not missing any episodes. Um, And also check out the episode wanderingbuff.com. I got an article I'm working on myself, just kind of about this end of the era for some of these Bills players, some of the changes we're going to see. Um, and how it impacts the future. Um, So make sure you're checking out the website. Want to wrap up tonight talking about the safeties and the cornerbacks and, you know, obviously kind of flushed out some of my thoughts there because there was, you know, some big impacts with some of these moves made. But just to kind of go through where we stand right now, um, in the cornerback room, Christian Benford, Razul Douglas, um, they have Kyrie Elam. Um, Dane Jackson is currently a free agent. Cam Lewis currently a free agent, and Taron Johnson. And honestly, those four names that I mentioned that are currently under contract, I feel very good about going into next year. Um, Dane Jackson and Cam Lewis both, I would say, I don't think are going to command a ton of money on the market. And I think they've both been valuable depth for a secondary that's gone through a lot of injuries and not just like valuable depth as in like, I feel like this guy could play if he needed to. Um, Dane Jackson was a starter for us. Um, Cam Lewis has been around forever and got like the most action he's seen last year. And honestly, I feel like myself included, have to like think past that one Justin Jefferson play with Cam Lewis and understand that he, he has been valuable depth to us. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing both of them brought back, um, especially with the contract I feel like is out there for them. Um, but I think Christian Benford 
kind of gets overlooked for just how good he's been. Um, and we go more to the conversation about Kyrie Elam being a bust than talking about like what Christian Benford has done as a six round pick in the same draft. Um, him and Douglas as my two outside corners, I feel great about. Um, I think Douglas being brought in was kind of this perfect scheme fit for this defense. We saw him making all kinds of plays on the ball. Um, and honestly looked every bit like prime Trey white out there. <laughs> like what, what we expected from him. And it, it honestly looked like, Trey White when teams were like were still willing to throw at him. And then I think kind of towards the tail end of seeing Trey play a lot, teams just stopped throwing at him. And it was easy to kind of forget how good Trey White was. Um I think teams just didn't figure out not to throw <laughs> at Reswell Douglas yet because he had just joined the team halfway through the season, whatever. Um but kind of resetting that that cb1 position and i i feel like these two guys together are almost like a 1a 1b there's like not this huge divide between who's the top guy and who's the second guy um so i feel very good about them as the top two um taron johnson like what else can i say about taron johnson that hasn't been said um extend that man clear up some more cap space Keep him here longer. Um, I think he's so important to this defense and what he's asked to do. Not only does he, you know, have great coverage against wide receivers in the slot, uh, but the Bills are able to stay in nickel so often because of what Taron Johnson's able to do, like almost as a linebacker. Um, he's great in run support. He's great in pass. Extend that man. And then after that, it's just kind of, rounding out the depth with some guys. I wouldn't be surprised to see another draft pick here. And honestly, it doesn't have to be an early investment. Um, we've <clears throat> we've seen all kinds of guys be successful being late round picks on this defense. And just the easy, you know, recency answers of Dane Jackson and Christian Benford. Um, we've seen some reclamation prog projects on the outside. Um, and then finally, Kyrie Elam. This is a dude that I'm 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 still not sleeping on him. Um, he's still super young, and honestly, I would love to see what the practices look like, all that like that. What's happening behind the scenes that's keeping him off the field? Because this is another season where when pressed into action. Uh, I know it's like his first play was terrible, but he again made plays down the stretch last last year. Um, we saw when he came in the previous year. I don't think we make it past the Dolphins without Kyrie Elam. Um, so, dude, that still has all kinds of athleticism, all the reasons that he was a first round pick for the Bills, and maybe we start to see him put it together. Um, like I said. I, there's more information than I have because when I, when I've seen him, the biggest thing I can say about him is um, he's a bit grabby and draw some flags. Um, I don't mind having that on my team. Uh, we see, we complain about teams like the chiefs doing it where they're kind of like over aggressive and they kind of gauge how they're going to play based on what flags the refs are throwing. Uh, I don't mind having that guy on my team. To take a couple flags and figure out if you have to dial it back. Um, but we've seen him be a playmaker. We know his athleticism. Having that guy be, you know, the, the first guy in off the bench, I'm not mad at that. And I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm in the minority with Kyrie Elam still. Uh, I haven't thrown in the towel on him. I am not one that wants to trade him away right now. Um, I think for, for being fairly cheap depth at the position with the ceiling that he still can be working towards, um, I feel very good about him being on the roster. Um, 
then moving into the safeties, obviously some huge changes are going to be coming here. Um, nothing official on Micah Hyde yet, but also haven't seen anything to suggest that he might be returning. Um, and honestly, of the two of Poyer and Hyde, I mean, Poyer was already technically under contract this year. Um, Hyde was up, and I haven't seen a, a sniffing of anything anywhere that Micah Hyde coming back for one more season was any sort of in the cards. Um, so I'm not counting on that. Um, obviously, just brought back Taylor Rapp, and then you got Demar Hamlin, and that's the safety room right now. Um, do I think this shoots up the list of needs for the Bills? Sure. Um, that that seems really surface level obvious. Um, do I think it's something that you just created a space where you have to go use a first round pick? A absolutely not. Um, I've already talked about it in this episode. There's a ton of free agents out there that I would be happy with. Um, again, the secondary, we've seen this regime being able to develop safeties, corners. Again, Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer cast offs before they came to Buffalo. Um, Micah Hyde being a converted corner. Um, just not an area where I'm like super concerned. Um, I'd like to see exactly what the plan is and how it shakes out. Um, if it's going to be, you know, a couple of younger guys back there, I'm, I'm going to need to see it on the field before I feel great about it. But like I said, Bobby Babbage is the defensive coordinator. He was working with Hoyer and Hyde as they came over. Um, McDermott, you can run down the laundry list of players that he's gotten production out of throughout his career. And <clears throat> again, I kind of couple that with what exactly is expected from the safeties now and um, how defenses are playing. And it's it's very much keep everything in front of you and be able to come up and make a tackle. And I think we're seeing a devaluation of the position for that reason. And, you know, I I just don't think that position is hard as hard to find as it used to be. And it's why we're not seeing, you know, tons of double digit contracts being given out to, to these, to these safeties right now. Um, sticking a pin in that one. Cause it's still a position group. I don't feel great on heading into the 2024 season as we stand right now. But like I said, we're in March, we have till August, September to round all this out. So Gonna trust in Bean right now because I feel like he has put together a Super Bowl caliber roster pretty much every year since he has joined the organization. Um, so I'm gonna let him cook a little bit and see where we end up. Um, that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. We've now gone through all the positions and where I kind of think we stand on them. Still gonna see a ton of moves going on, um, whether it's restructures, extensions. Um, and free agency right around the corner, which I think the Bills might be a bigger player than we expected um, just a few days ago. Um, still have some some money that we can free up restructuring Josh Allen, um, some extensions I'd like to see happen. Um, so we'll see what happens in the coming days. Like I said, free agency right around the corner. Um, so make sure you're subscribed um, so you can get my thoughts on all those moves as they happen. Um, but until next week, as always, go Bills.